Large air-cushioned landing craft speed onto the hostile beach as enemy fire reaches out from defensive positions all along the rocky shoreline. Cannon and machine gun fire penetrate the rubber skirts of the LCACs, adjusting to aim up at the actual body of the craft, where it can score real casualties on the Americans. A slight buzzing noise is heard overhead, growing louder by the second. Suddenly, the Chinese positions start exploding one by one, and in desperation, the defenders shift their fire up at the sky. But the drones in the swarm are far too small to be effectively destroyed by kinetic weapons, so the defenders can't stop the terrible rain of highly maneuverable and highly precise explosives decimating their lines. Even dug-in positions are not safe, as the nimble drones simply fly through firing slits to explode inside, showering the defenders with hypersonic metal fragments. Chinese anti-drone defense weapons come online, painting the sky in swaths of electronic noise. Drones fall by the dozens, but there's hundreds more to replace them. Eventually, other specialized drones hardened against EM interference start dive-bombing the EW emitters. The swarm continues its suicidal attack unabated as the first of the Marine landing craft finally hit the beach. But as the landing ramps come down, it's not Marines or even infantry fighting vehicles that come spilling out, but rather a small horde of tracked drones, each about the size of a steamer trunk. The drone vehicles surge forward, the front line immediately falling to landmines and defensive fire. That doesn't matter much to the mindless robots, as those behind simply push forward and ahead. They run into more enemy fire and even more landmines, but in their wake leave behind a tracked path through which the marines who will soon hit the shore can travel, largely safe from the landmines. The drones themselves now put out a steady barrage of cannon fire, firing 20mm cannons and 50 caliber machine guns. Most are destroyed, but some make it all the way to the Chinese positions where they promptly explode leaving behind 10-foot craters and showering a large area in explosive fragments. The marines that are now hitting the beach use the downed drones as cover, as special drone operators rapidly dispatch many swarms of very agile drones the size of a small bird. Using virtual reality goggles, the operators guide those drones in with pinpoint accuracy, killing individual Chinese defenders. Out at sea, a Chinese task force attempts to dislodge the American amphibious assault group and end the beach landings. As the big Type 55 destroyers near anti-ship missile range, sonar operators suddenly warn of a strange sound they've never heard before. It sounds like an organic source, but dozens of them, as if a school of very large tuna suddenly turned heel and set course straight for the Chinese ships. Just three meters below the waves, American anti-ship drones designed like large fish and using a similar propulsion method, speed toward the Chinese destroyers and the cruisers. This drone swarm numbers at four dozen, and it was deployed months ago before hostilities even began. The swarm lingered in the region, surfacing to use their solar cell-covered skin to recharge their internal batteries. Their strange fish-like construction made them largely invisible to traditional Chinese surveillance and early warning equipment. Now the school of deadly fish is amongst the enemy ships, the Chinese having realized the danger they were in far too late. Deck crews man machine guns and desperately fire down at the swift, dark shapes swimming through the water below them. But the man-made fish slam into the sides of the Chinese ships, detonating their anti-ship munitions and punching large holes in armored hulls. Each fish only packs about 100 pounds of high explosives, but working together in a swarm, the deadly fish soon cripple numerous Chinese vessels. Only one will sink, but the rest are mission kills, which require towing to make it back to port safely if American submarines or surface combatants don't catch up and wipe them out first. Hundreds of miles above the Earth, the Chinese break the ultimate taboo and attack American satellites with anti-satellite weapons. These high-speed missiles slam into American military satellites in low orbit. In a few hours, they'll begin knocking out satellites in higher orbit, effectively blinding America's eyes in the sky and breaking its global communications chain. But from the launch pads in the U.S., half a dozen rockets speed to space. Once they're 100 miles above the atmosphere, they release their payload, hundreds of miniature satellites which quickly disperse into loose constellations. Each satellite only has a tiny payload, a small communications antenna, optical or infrared sensor, or radar surveillance receiver. However, by networking together, the vast constellations replicate the capabilities of sensors and receivers hundreds of times larger than themselves. China's attempts to break America's space-based network is futile. There's just too many targets to shoot at now. The preceding scenario isn't a piece of fiction from a war in the far-flung future. It's how a possible war with China would play out just 18 months from today. 
Early in September 2023, Deputy Secretary of Defense Kathleen Hicks announced the Replicator Initiative, America's plan to win any conflict with China, not 10 or 20 years from today, but now. America faces a very significant risk of war with China and an equally significant challenge in fighting said war. The Chinese Communist Party under direction of President Xi Jinping has made it clear that reunification with Taiwan will happen, one way or another, either peacefully or by force. U.S. President Joe Biden broke the status quo and firmly stated that the U.S. would come to the defense of Taiwan in case of Chinese invasion, saying the quiet part out loud for the first time in U.S.-Chinese relations. But why should the U.S. care about Taiwan, and how would the Replicator Initiative win such a war? Taiwan is one of the most strategically important places on Earth for both China and the United States, as well as anyone who enjoys the liberal world order and would rather see democracy rather than Chinese-style autocracy continue to spread. Nations like Ireland have criticized narratives such as this and done so from the position of extreme privilege, safely on the westernmost edge of Europe away from potential hostile actors like either Russia or China, and deep in the bosom of US-led regional security. China's taking of Taiwan would be a catastrophe for the current liberal world order, as the island would make for a jumping-off point for further Chinese expansion into the Pacific. It would break nearly a century of containment of Chinese communism via what's known as the First Island Chain, a chain of US allies and partners that stretches from Japan to the Philippines. With China in Taiwan, the chain is broken, and it becomes significantly more difficult to deter further Chinese aggression, something that, again, countries like Ireland have the luxury of doubting, while China's neighbors, Japan, the Philippines, and South Korea very much don't. China's bid to break the First Island Chain is a matter of self-preservation, or at least self-preservation for the Communist Party. Authoritarianism cannot thrive in a liberal world order, and already China feels the pressure of liberalism on its doorstep. The massive riots that shook Hong Kong to its core for months in 2019 and 2020 were proof that many Chinese are increasingly tired of the Communist Party and its oppressive policies. The Communist Party won in the end, to the great loss of the people in Hong Kong, but the incident spurred a wave of paranoia at the highest levels of Chinese power. To preserve their power, the Chinese Communists have taken to exporting authoritarianism regionally via the transfer of surveillance technology to like-minded states. They've also heavily meddled in the political affairs of neighbors, like any good would-be superpower does, and used everything from economic bribes to threats in order to steer global trends. But as long as the US and its partners can contain the Chinese military, China can only do so much to change their neighbors' opinions. Push the US out of the Pacific, though, and suddenly Chinese authoritarianism is backed up by a significant number of planes, ships, and tanks that dwarf anything regional powers can field. Taiwan is important for another reason, though. It's a key player in the global economy. Known as its silicon shield, Taiwan invested heavily into semiconductor manufacturing, becoming a global leader and manufacturing a significant supply of the world's most advanced computer chips. Unless Ireland figures out how to power their electronics with potatoes instead of computer chips, keeping the Chinese Communist Party from having a stranglehold on this global supply is the only way to safeguard national economies. And with China in control of the majority of the world's supply of advanced computer chips, every nation in the world, including the US, would be at its mercy. Do as the Chinese Communist Party says or have fun watching your economy collapse to pre-1990s levels. The US's fight to keep China out of Taiwan is not just in the interest of America, it's in the interest of everyone who doesn't want Winnie the Pooh banned in their country. But the US faces a significant challenge trying to take on the Chinese military. On paper, while China recently acquired more ships than the US, the American military is more powerful by an order of magnitude. China has more ships, but American vessels are larger, carry more missiles, and still outclass their Chinese counterparts in key technologies. US submarines are more capable and stealthier and the F-35 and F-22 haunt the dreams of Chinese fighter pilots. America's biggest advantage, though, is that much like Europe in the recent past, that Europeans like to conveniently forget about, war is basically a national pastime. The US has the greatest concentration of war colleges and the most prestigious. Its defense industry is without peer. Americans absolutely love skipping doctor visits, content knowing that instead, another Tomahawk cruise missile was squeezed out of a Raytheon factory. And every 20 years or so, the US launches yet another crusade to bring freedom and democracy to people who may or may not have specifically requested it at the time. Despite this, America faces significant, some think insurmountable challenges in war against China. Because as Russia's invasion of Ukraine has taught us, numbers really do matter. 
Sure, Russia is basically just slapping cardboard on shopping carts and calling it a tank now, but it's managed to weather the storm of much more capable Ukrainian forces through sheer mass alone. This is bad news when the US looks at a conflict with China, because the F-35 and the F-22 will beat the pants out of the J-20, but there's only so many of either to go around, and China's fleet of J-20s keeps getting bigger every year. America's biggest weakness is the part that everyone who criticizes the US never likes to admit. US commitments are global, meaning that US forces are directly responsible for maintaining regional stability around the world. Without significant US military power in Europe, Russia and the Soviet Union before it would have either coerced or directly forced European nations into its sphere of influence. This has never been more apparent than today, when the entire European effort to aid Ukraine is but a fraction of what the US has been able to provide, highlighting the absolutely criminal state of European military readiness. In the Middle East, American sailors and marines are basically all that's keeping Iran from launching a catastrophic regional war, or blackmailing the world by choking off vital global oil arteries running directly along its shores. In Africa, the US has provided a rallying point for local powers to concentrate their efforts on combating extremism and criminal enterprises. And in Asia, the US Navy is all that's keeping Chinese ships currently using water cannons on other nations' fishing vessels from simply blowing them out of the water instead. Such global commitments are America's Achilles heel, because that means that the US simply cannot concentrate its forces for an apocalyptic one-on-one -on -one slug match with China, lest bad actors take advantage of the lapse in US-led security to launch their own agendas. So when it comes time to take on the Chinese military, the US is basically only able to commit its specific fleet, reinforced with selected deployments out of its other global commands. Suddenly, Chinese numbers, already prodigious, count for a lot. Enter the Replicator Initiative, America's answer to superior Chinese numbers. Not a new defense program per se, Replicator will not draw any additional funding from the defense budget. Instead, this program is an initiative to change how the US military looks at present and near-term problems, and how they can be solved rapidly and efficiently with off-the-shelf technology whenever possible. In a sense, it's a dramatic expansion of the US Air Force's Rapid Capabilities Office, which is tasked with quickly responding to evolving threats in a timely manner, only it aims to steer the entire American military in new directions. Replicator is thus not specifically a program to counter China, that is simply its current objective. As announced by Deputy Secretary of Defense Hicks, in 18 to 24 months the current strategic environment will be reassessed and a new goal, if necessary, is set. But for now, Replicator's goal is to neutralize China's numbers, and to do this it's taking lessons from the war in Ukraine. Estimates place Ukrainian drone losses at about 10,000 a month. This includes drones of all sizes and makes, from large Bayraktar surveillance and attack drones to smaller DJI drones purchased directly from commercial retailers. Ukraine has done something incredible completely blunting the might of the titanic Russian military with cheap, attritable swarms of drones. It's impossible to glance at any news coverage of Ukraine and not see a new video of Russian troops and vehicles making brief but best friends with Ukrainian suicide drones. This is a capability America is looking to exploit and leverage against China's superior numbers. The current goal of the Replicator initiative is to immediately begin researching how to implement drones in vast swarms on the land, the air, the sea, and even space and how to do so largely using off-the-shelf commercial technology. Inevitably, though, new types of specialized military drones will be developed, similar to the switchblade drones used in Ukraine today. However, the focus of Replicator is for these drones to be easily mass-produced and extremely attritable. That means these drones have to be cheap enough to be lost in large quantities without significantly hurting the DoD's pocketbook. China has created an excellent strategic position for itself in the Pacific, establishing a network of defenses meant to keep the US at arm's bay. Known as anti-access area denial, it's all in the name. Using aircraft, drones, and long-range missiles, China's hoping to keep US ships and aircraft far out of any fighting in the Western Pacific. The US's answer to A2D2, as the cool kids call it, is ADA2, because good god does the US love acronyms. All domain attritable autonomy is meant to directly counter China's A2D2 capabilities by simply overwhelming Chinese A2D2 assets through sheer numbers of expendable drones. Larger US combat platforms can move in to win the fight. These drones will operate in large swarms, in all warfighting domains, even space. Traditional surveillance satellites, for instance, can take years to fund, produce, and finally launch, 
and can be completely destroyed by a single cheap anti-satellite weapon. However, by simply putting up a networked swarm of drones doing the same job as a larger, more expensive satellite, America's space capabilities become so numerous to the point of it becoming utterly futile to attempt to take them out in the first place. We already have proof of the concept in Starlink, vital to Ukrainian war efforts, even if Elon Musk conveniently decided to shut Starlink down just as a Ukrainian drone swarm attack was about to descend on Russian ships in Crimea, causing the drones to go out of contact or drown. Remember this drone that washed up on a Crimean beach in September 2022? Turns out there's evidence that Musk sabotaged the drone attack by shutting Starlink down as the Ukrainians launched their attack because he apparently believed that a strategic defeat in Crimea would prompt Putin to launch nuclear weapons. With Starlink service to Ukraine now funded by the Department of Defense, who we assume had a very long chat with Mr. Musk about his interference in the war, it's clear large swarms of satellites pose a nigh insurmountable problem for Russian forces. Likewise, Replicator aims to present just such a conundrum to the Chinese anti-satellite forces. The biggest bombshell of the Replicator initiative's announcement, though, was its timeline. Many thousands of new drones in active service in the next 18 to 24 months. This isn't another lengthy weapons acquisition program, it's a boot in the ass to the DoD's notoriously lengthy procurement timelines to get warfighters the tools they need tomorrow, today. Described as a more cultural shift than a physical program, Replicator is the product of a new reality. The US is back to great power competition, but unlike in the Cold War, technology today advances so rapidly that capabilities must be upgraded regularly, not decades apart. This is why the Block 4 upgrade for the F-35 is so vital, as it'll create an open architecture design for the fighter which will allow future upgrades to be installed faster and more cheaply. A similar attitude is already present in the US Air Force's Next Generation Air Dominance Program, which aims to field the world's first sixth-generation fighter, not in two decades, as a major fighter program typically takes to mature, but by 2030, as a combat-ready fighter, no less. The news that an NGAD prototype had already taken flight in the late 2010s sent shockwaves around the world, especially as the first test flight came a mere few years after the program was officially announced. NGAD represents what the Replicator Initiative aims to do with the entire U.S. military, not just the Air Force. U.S. military culture needs to shift away from a legacy systems mindset to one of constant innovation and rapid development. Technologies such as 3D printing are making this possible and are already being used to create the U.S. Army's replacement for the Bradley Infantry Fighting Vehicle. But the hardest challenge for Replicator is not devising new tools and capabilities, but rather changing the mindset of the personnel within the Department of Defense themselves, encouraging innovation and risk-taking as a way to ensure that the state of the art is not a destination, but an ongoing journey. Now go check out Russia and China versus NATO, or click this other video instead.